Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host Steve Doyman and Larry Correa. Today's episode, interview with Steve Bollier, recorded live at 20 Books to 50K, Las Vegas, November 2023. All right. So uh, thank you all for joining us as you watch us interview someone. Yay. Yeah. Um, you know, we appreciate you all coming and just, just join us as we talk with, with Steve over here. Um, so... Uh, you guys kind of know how this all goes. I'm assuming you've all listened to the show. If you haven't, well, uh, welcome to the party, pal. Um, so, you know. I was going to say, should we have the people who have seen the show sing the theme song? No. Okay. No. Ain't nobody want to hear that. Sorry. We love you, but not that much. Um, all right. So, welcome to the Writer Dojo. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm Steve. You guys know me. I'm Steve Diamond. Larry Correa, do you have a quote? Did you manage to find a quote? Uh, Viva Las Vegas. There we go. Ah. Um, so today, since we're here in Vegas, and since uh, you know, since since Steve Bollier was here, um, we figured it'd be a great time to have him on to talk about a topic that neither Larry or I can ever talk about, and that's running your own publisher and all the craziness of it and stuff. So Steve, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, you just did. I'm there Steve. You go. Hi, <laughs> I'm Steve Bollier. I, uh, I run Athon Books with Rhett C. Bruno. We are a science fiction and fantasy publisher that specializes in lit RPG and military sci-fi and really anything that kind of falls in that speculative fiction market. Um, we've been doing this. Our five-year anniversary comes up November 18th. Nice. And it's right here, and I did nothing for it. I had no idea. I oh, just, you know, I just happened. Thank you. Uh, I also write as Jamie Castle, written about, I don't know, 28 books in the past five or six years. Um, and I am known for writing the stuff that I tell my authors not to write. It's very much a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do thing. Uh, there are <laughs> certain markets that work, certain markets that don't, and I love writing in the markets that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the short version. That's the short version. Yeah. Well, I, I blurbed your uh, your weird west. You did, um, which was awesome. It was, uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, Black badge series. Yep. It was really good. Really Thank good. You. I enjoyed the hell out of it. And the the audio book is awesome because you got the narrator from um, Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, Red Dead Redemption oh, too. Roger that's Clark right. narrated that series, and it is. Uh, I don't know. It's a joy to listen to. That's it fantastic. makes for a wicked cool audio book. Listening to that yep. voice. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cowboy Miley. around a campfire telling you a story, but just with monsters all, yeah, and evil yeah. and you know, get sent back by God to take care of problems. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was pretty baller. Highly recommended. Thank you. Um, so you uh, having a newer publishing house, but you guys have been rather successful. You've put yeah. together a pretty good stable of authors. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, we've got about somewhere around 200, 225 authors in varying states of activity, right? Some are some have written, you know, one book, one book series that took them 12, 15 years to write. And that's probably all they're ever going to gonna write. And then you've got guys like Rick Partlow, who's actually sitting in the front here, who's, you know, turns out a book a month-ish, um, give or take six weeks maybe, and um, is on like his 63rd book, I believe, 65th book. He's correcting me. So we do everything from that, you know, Scott Sigler and J Jonathan Mayberry and Steve Diamond's actually on yeah. the on the lists now yes, of eight uh, authors yeah. that we love. Um, I'm glad you added that last part. Yeah, man. And then every, you know, we've got Lou Diamond Phillips, uh, actor from La Bamba and all of that. He's one of our authors. He's actually working on book two of a series um, that he released called uh, Tinderbox, um, Soldier of Adira. That's so, fantastic. Yeah. I love him in Longmire. Oh, dude. That's oh, I mean, it's so been some good. of the greatest joy in my life is we were in Vegas. I'm sorry. We were in New York uh, earlier this year and Lou reached out to me and he's like, hey, we're going to get coffee, you know, and like here we are, stupid Steve, like going to have coffee with Lou Diamond Phillips because he wanted to have coffee with me. And it was a great joy in my life to experience that's that. He seems like he's a pretty cool dude, guy. He's so down to earth. So nice. cool. And unfortunately, we released his book during COVID. Oh, and yeah. so although COVID, just so you know, COVID was massive for Athon. Like interesting. Bless everybody who had struggles during that time. I was hospitalized for, you know, I was hospitalized for five days and and down for an entire month during that time. So that was not fun. But everyone was stuck at home reading. And so our business went through the roof and we went from a four thousand dollar Kickstarter to a multi million dollar company in five years. And you know, the number two earner on KDP and we have six out of the top ten ACX projects. I mean we've gone from zero to hero in a very short period of time. And I actually can look at, Kate, at, at 
2020 as like that was the moment. pivotal moment for us where we sold a lot of freaking books. That's actually really interesting because on the trad pub side, we do everything better than trad pub. Well, <laughs> <laughs> on this one, I ain't going to argue with you either because what happened if you, if you're used to a third or you know a third or or, or you know whatever <laughs> of your of your income coming from actual physical book sales from physical bookstores, you know stuff other than Amazon, and they close ninety nine percent of them. Yep. Dude, let me tell you, that makes for a crappy royalty check. Holy yep. moly. I think if people knew the money that was on Kindle Unlimited, they'd have less negative things to say about Kindle Unlimited. But most people I've talked to that say, well, I sell more in print than Kindle Unlimited, or I sell more why than Kindle Unlimited. My first answer is, let me see. Let me see, because until you've seen what 2 million page reads a day on one book looks like financially, you've never experienced success as an author. Like Some of these guys are making just millions a year uh, on KU. And then that doesn't include the sales of their books and the print sales of their books that we still do, especially for the bigger titles through just print on demand. And I don't have a warehouse. I'm a dude, I mean, Rhett, Rhett and I, we jokingly say we're just dudes in our underwear chasing our kids around all day. And it's, it's only half a joke. People ask me where I work. I'm like, I put pants on and go upstairs. Like, that's my life. I mean, at least you put pants on. I, do. I sometimes don't. I do. Well, this is interesting because, like, I've seen old school publishing. I've been doing this for 15 years. Right. And so when I first got into this, like, every year, back when they had uh, the New York City Book Expo thingy, right? What a waste of money that is. So I'd fly out there, and I would go to these, um, like, the big mega publishing houses, and they'd have their meetings. Their thing, and they're renting office space in the world's most expensive real estate. And, and what are the people in that office space doing? They're just dudes sitting at desks and computers yeah. talking to people on the phone. Well, and publishing houses are, are so tremendously bloated in terms of number of people. So oh, like, they're absurd. Rhett and I oh, started yeah. this thing, and it was just us. And he had a certain uh, set of skills. He was Liam Neeson, and I had a certain set of, set of skills. <laughs> and they blended so nicely together. You didn't compare yourself to anyone? I didn't. I am Steve intentionally Bullier, Jamie Castle. Um, <laughs> I stand alone on my own two feet. The Jason Steve yeah. is so, Sylvester Stallone. Yep. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I, I was actually the girl that got taken in Taken. He's Liam Neeson trying to find me. <laughs> um, so, I, but actually, funny enough, there is sort of a funny parallel there. Like, I'm the creative artsy guy that's been a musician my whole life and been an artist my whole life, and I write because it's fun. And then Rhett is the business shark that knows everything about. I've never seen Rhett wrong in my entire career with Rhett. He says things sometimes that authors go, uh, and then I go, just wait. And I've never seen him wrong. He's always right about the market. He's always right about what works, what doesn't work. We've turned down major opportunities that um, at the end of the day, I'm very glad that we did turn down because Rhett saw the forest for the trees. Um, and so when we started, it was, it was just him and me. I did all the editing, all the book covers. He did whatever he did, you know, money stuff. I don't know. Accounting um, stuff. You know, stuff. It's a black box. And as we grew, of course, we've got a couple of employees now and we've got several editors and I've got artists on, on salary and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, it's me and Rhett still doing the work of a 61 person company. And I, I, I often joke and say, man, I really wish that I worked for a company because the number of things that I do in a day, I could space out over six months of time and tell them that's just how long it takes. And that's not arrogance, but we work with all of these publishers and we go, why are we waiting three weeks for typography on this audiobook? I, can I just do it? It'll take 10 seconds. And it really does take 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so everything's so bloated and there's so many people doing so many things that it's very difficult to get books out which is really the only goal we as authors have well and and one of this one of the things that because larry and i've had a lot of conversations with folk who are at you know say tor or orbit or um at what used to be daw and so many of them talk about how there's in addition to all the problems there's actually so much infighting within within the company and we've Edi seen editors are battling each too. other Absolutely. they're trying to steal each other's um like marketing budgets mm -hmm. and stuff weird, and it's ridiculous weird stuff. petty fiefdoms 100 <laughs> percent um, within the kingdom like jockeying for position yep. it's bizarre yep. and people who just hate each other yep. and, and and actively sabotage each other and then how they treat their writers and and uh i'm not complaining because mine's like a look you know we got like four employees in north carolina we're, sure you know but um Dude, some of these places are just 
insane. And then, and they're, they're, they're the world's most expensive office building to have 50 people who hate each other yeah. who don't even really like books. That is the weirdest part that I've seen in a lot of the publishing houses that we've been connected with is like, specifically because we work in, in, in speculative fiction and genre fiction, um, that genre is not considered literary enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of looked down upon. And meanwhile, I go, can, can I show you how much money we make doing this? And then please show me your, show me what you're doing. And they're so focused on print that they're leaving the market behind, right? I was in music in about 2008. Um, I did OzFest, did all the stuff. I was a metal musician. And we had a deal on the table from Warner Brothers Records. And after looking at the contract and seeing that we were not going to get paid for digital sales toward our advance. It was only CDs in a market when iTunes is already established. I turned it down in a heartbeat because I saw where things were going. And that's where we are today in the book industry. We've got, uh, God bless them. I, st I mean, I still read trad pub for sure, but like they're so focused on a market that is, I don't want to say dying, but on its way out. The, and they're forgetting the ebook market. And they're like, well, this ebook's $17.99. I'm sorry, that works for six people on this planet. Larry might be one of them. You know, no, I'm, I'm like a $6.99 to $8.99. $6.99, man. Yeah. $4.99 is pretty average. $4.99 is a good price point if you can make it. But then you have to dig into every single subgenre. Military sci-fi is a different price point than lit RPG. And thrillers are a different price point than urban fantasy like they are all different and it's because the market has come to expect it and we act, you know you can trace back why the market has come to expect it five years ago the 99 cent thing started in sci-fi and it became a thing and it stayed a thing and the sci-fi readers don't look at it as a lesser product whereas another genre would go ah it's a 99 cent piece of shit, i'm not going to buy it but they right. go no i understand this book one's 99 cents and then they're going to charge me more as i go but this, this is my entry. I can get in for cheap yeah, right yeah, now. 100%. I yeah. can see if I like it and it didn't cost me much. But then you got the KU folks who are not paying anything more than their $14.99 a month. And actually, that's who we care about. I don't, don't mean to say we don't care about the buyer, but the buyer is a catalyst to visibility in the ranks. I don't care what price point we sell it at because that's not where I'm making money. We're using sales to get visible so that the KU readers who come in by the millions spend the money on page reads and especially on the bigger books, you know, you got to look at the size of your book too, but these lit RPG books are 250,000 words. That's some big ass KU read benefits. Yeah. That's like eight or $9 a read profit. Interesting. Interesting. We get asked a lot about KU and that's something that neither one of us knows a lot about. What are the downsides? The downsides is if you've ever not been in, if you've ever, if there's ever been a point where you're not a KU author, good luck. There's, al there's exclusive algorithms that exist where it goes, where KDP, you know, computers say you're not playing the game. You're not exclusive. So you're treated as a lesser, right? We brought in, you know, Kevin J. Anderson and Jonathan Maber, and we brought in these guys that have all been wide for a period of time. And we can see the direct translation of KU reads to non-exclusive author versus somebody who has stayed exclusive forever. Hmm. Nicholas Sansbury Smith is a great example. I don't know if he's here. I was, I was having lunch with him. He said he might be here. Anyway, Nicholas Sansbury Smith wrote Helldivers, uh, Extinction Cycle series. He's massive, massive author. He went out of KU, watched it happen, came back in, watched what happened when he hit the back into the algorithm and things kind of crashed a little bit for him. He's still phenomenally <laughs> successful, but I mean, I see the numbers. We publish Helldivers now. We are in, in conjunction with, uh, with Blackstone on that to do the eBooks in KU. Um, and you know, I, I, I humbly say, I don't know that there's anyone alive that understands the KU market like Athon Books. We've got data for days and we know when something's gonna work. We know when it's not gonna work. And the only time that that's kind of pushed askew is when Amazon breaks, which by the way, we are in an Amazon is broken market right now. I don't know if y'all have followed this July stuff happens and summer Amazon always breaks. If I'm, if I'm helping anyone here, don't release your book during the summer. Amazon breaks because algorithms change in the summer and things have to figure themselves out. And during the summer we see ranking 
delays, we see things of that nature. And so right now we're in November and they've still not corrected themselves from July. And lo and behold, boom, AI narration, click of the button. No wonder we've been screwing with stuff behind the scenes and it's always some big reveal that tells us why everything broke, but you're always sitting through that time going, okay, what's the big change coming along? And so Rhett and I have been anticipating it. This is, by the way, the first beta that Rhett and I have not known about beforehand, which um, we've been advocating against AI for the last eight months with KDP, and I've spent this entire week having meetings with them regarding this stuff. And um, I love all of you in KDP, but I feel like that was intentional because they knew the pushback that that we'd have there. And so I'm really looking forward to moving forward in this because I've got some plans to hopefully put in front of the right people at KDP as to why this is a horrible idea and how it's going to destroy this industry. And I don't think it's for the reasons that they're considering. Right. The consumer is going to be seriously sub quality, sub butt reamed yeah. over this thing. Am I allowed to say that on? Yeah, uh, I mean, you just did. I so. did. Um, Worst case scenario, our producer will go through and beep okay. anything when he edits it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for, for we love our, you. We love you, Jack. Yeah, sorry, Jack. <laughs> um, okay. So for for the listeners who are going to be listening to this as it's recorded, um, we're going to take we're going to take a really really long break right now. For those of you who are in the room, we'll see you in like three seconds. We'll be right back. I know what you're thinking. What is Steve doing here in the middle of the commercial break? Trust me, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. And what is important? Well, how about the new revised edition of my first novel, Residue? So what all did I revise? Well, I'm obviously not the title because it's still called Residue. I'm not stupid. But I did revise the entire novel to add new content. We're talking more guns, monsters, and mad science. So if you've been waiting for the chance to read about Jack Bishop, a guy who can see the psychic residue left behind by monsters and murder victims, now is your chance. Residue, available in print, ebook, and audio on amazon.com. All right, back to your regularly scheduled ads or whatever it is that you do during the time Larry and I aren't talking. See ya. All right, so let, let's rewind a little bit. Um, I'm morbidly curious in that, like, I want to see the tr I want to see the car wreck happen as it's happening, sort of a thing. Why on earth did you and uh, Inret be like, you know what, we should totally do this publishing thing? This is a great idea. So I already had the hardest, the second hardest job in America, according to many lists. I was a pastor for 14 years. Right. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and I know it sounds like a lot of people go, ah, it's cushy. They just do a Sunday morning thing, whatever, man. I had, I, I never had more trouble in my life. Right. You know, my phone never stopped ringing and 2 AM I'm telling my wife bye because a guy that's in our church has a flat tire 30 minutes away and I'm the only human being he knows that might help him kind of thing. And, um, and so I, I had done that for 14 years and there was a political move that was made at the church that I was at where everybody that was young got fired all at once out of nowhere, that's shocking crazy. experience for me. And I was, I found myself in a position where I was uh, picking up pieces of things that I didn't even know were broken. Um, and so, Immediately, I went to, what do I know how to do? I started a house church, and I was planning on building it and doing the thing that I've always done, and it was just going to be a new thing. And, um, you know, this this might be weird for some of you here, but I heard God say, this is not what I want you to do. And I went, well, cool. So how about a sign? What is, what is it that you want me to do? <laughs> <clears throat> and so I immediately called Rhett. Rhett and I had been writing together. We had written probably seven books together at the time, and we found success in fantasy and he had found wild success in sci-fi as a matter of fact he was a um penguin random house author who had a, a series called titanborn that sold like for crap with penguin random house and we bought the rights back and sold more in a day than he sold in the entire two years that they had it and um and so we looked at what we had been successful in doing and we went okay we'd been talking about maybe jokingly talking about starting a publishing house 
the whole time we were writing. Hey, this went really well. I bet we could do it for other people. Cool. He's a full-time architect. I'm a full-time pastor working 80 plus hours a week. I've got young kids. It's not going to work. So I called him. I'm like, dude, I don't have a job and I don't know where, what I'm going to do. He said, I'll, I'll quit and we'll start the publishing house. Full-time architect quit like the next day. Huh. Went into the office and said, I want to get my two weeks. The guy said, I, know, I knew this was coming. You're fine, man. I know you want to write. I know you want to do what you're doing. Have my blessing. Go do your thing. So that was in like maybe September 2018. November of 2018, we did a Kickstarter that was really mostly for um, exposure or awareness. That you know, So we set the bar really low at something we knew we could fulfill. It was like four grand. Uh, Michael J. Sullivan kind of came on board and supported things and several other folks in the industry really liked what we were, what we were looking to do. And so we, we funded that really quick, but Rhett and I had advance money from some series that we did. We're pretty big on audio, not Larry big, but we're pretty big on audio. And so our advances were really good at the time. And so that carried me through with my family financially during that time, but it also allowed me to go, I could take this risk Mm -hmm. to try this thing. And within a very short period of time, we had names like Paul Anthony Jones, who has since died. As a matter of fact, his story is, is incredibly crazy. He was a 47 North author. Oh, did I say 47 North author? Yeah. That's hard to say, actually. That was, uh, um, that was the Amazon. That was Amazon's imprint. Yep, that was Amazon's imprint. And for whatever reason, they didn't want his new series. So he and Rhett had been in connection. Rhett's involvement in the science fiction community before I came around was paramount tantamount, whichever word we want to use to our success, because everyone owed him a favor. He runs something called Sci-Fi Bridge, which is really one of the most successful newsletters uh, for science fiction out there, and it's free. It's You just email him and say, I want to do a news blast, and as long as you meet certain criteria, uh, it's a free blast, and it sells a crap ton of books. And so all of those authors who had used that sort of owed Red a favor. And so we were able to cash in on a lot of those things and really build up our first few launches. And Paul Anthony Jones, um, he died of cancer. And in the middle of it, I was his editor. So I edited book one. And then I sort of had to finish writing book two for him after he passed. And then book three, we were like, uh, we were ramping up as a company. I'm like, I don't have time to write another somebody else's book right now. So we were able to bring a gentleman named Bob Greenberger, who's written for Marvel. And he's a phenomenal ghostwriter. Um, and he was able to take the multiple notebooks of n- notes that Paul's wife found and finish up book three. But that series was very successful with us. Uh, for us, we took Joshua Guyu's Commune series, which was wildly successful on audio, and we relaunched it on ebook. And then Rick Partlow came along with Wholesale Slaughter, and Rick was actually the Rick was the author that solidified that we knew what we were doing. Uh, he took a huge chance on us because we were just a couple of guys who had a couple successes and, you know, he had written 30 books or so at the time and, um, Wholesale Slaughter did phenomenally well. And then Drop Trooper came out and became the thing, yeah. right? Drop Trooper was a massive success. And from there it gained the notoriety of Athon knows what they're doing. And Lit RPG fell into our laps. Lit RPG, we become the largest publisher of Lit RPG, um, I would argue by, you know, uh, uh, we might have different discussions regarding who's the largest, but like we have the largest catalog and some of the biggest titles on the planet. When your timing on that was kind of perfect for the generation of that, of that genre, of that genre really blowing up and coming to public attention. I think you guys were like kind of perfectly poised to take advantage of that. Because, I mean, 10 years ago, nobody had ever heard of that. Right. Uh, no in America, right? Korea, yeah. Russia, all those places. It's, sure. we're, we're about five years behind all of those yeah. folks in terms of storytelling. About five years ago, people in America started talking about it, yep. and I had no idea what they yeah. were talking Brand about. Brand new thing. And I have a theory that like most people actually have no idea what progression and fantasy, pro- progression fantasy and lit RPG are in terms of readers. I think that what happens is we have access to our core group of progression fantasy readers, and the authors have theirs, and they all know what it is. But when it hits Amazon, you've got millions of readers who just love fantasy. And they think this is the new fantasy. Hmm. They don't really know what progression fantasy is. They just know they like it. And so we're introducing them to a brand new genre. And it is, uh, it, it, it's is—it's been made up of a lot of readers who went, I could do that. And so it's in its, in its infancy, it's still struggling to be the literary brilliancy that we you know, want to gain, we want to get to, right? Um, 
And a lot of them are birthed out of web serials, uh, guys who wrote four million words without books in mind. So there's no book cutoffs. It's this, uh, here's 250,000 words. There's a chaotic lump. It sort of ends here. <laughs> here's your book. And so, you know, you navigate those waters uh, as gracefully as you can. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a wonderful new genre that who expected a new genre? Like what the heck? We haven't had a new genre in a long time and yeah. it's, it's new. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually interesting because if you look at like the timeline of these different things, there's like there's this ebb and flow of, of genres that kind of pop. And it, it is, if, you're, if you're positioned when that genre pops, like for me it was like when urban fantasy kind of spun off from paranormal romance right. and became kind of its own thing. Jim Butcher was the man yep. on that for me. So I'm kind of like, timing-wise was, was a few years later, coat writing Jim. Uh, awful, but then like or, or I said, then that but urban fantasy has been around forever, but it just yeah. wasn't a known thing. Listen, was, Jim, was, does Jim listen to this podcast? Sometimes. He's the only yeah. human being on earth that I still need a blurb from. Like I, oh, really? would, I'd give. Oh, a, I love Jim. I'd yeah, pay. Jim's awesome. I'd pay. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, little, little side note. Little side note. I got. I got. A, I got a. I got a, twi a, a tweet last night from somebody who was listening to Jim's live stream for the the Aeronauts Windless, and he was um, in front of a, a live audience and talking to him. And apparently, I don't know where the audience was. But they're not fans of mine, apparently. So Jim's talking, and he goes, and somebody asks, he's like, when are the Den Denarians coming back to uh, Dresden Files? He goes, well, book 20. But, you know, Larry Cree and I have talked about having him show up in the Monster Boo! Hunter universe. And the audience goes, Boo! dead silent. Yeah. It's just like 29 minutes of the video. Somebody said it to me. The audience is just dead silent. And Jim's like, all right, any other questions? <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh, Jim, no, what you doing? <laughs> That's fun. He's a good dude. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Dresden Files fan. Uh, Black Badge was coined. Uh, I mean, you actually said it perfectly. It's Harry Dresden. Or, yeah, Harry Dresden walks into Tombstone. Tombstone. Yeah. Um, or no, maybe you said The Witcher walks into oh, Tombstone, okay. which is actually perfect as well. But I always called it. Dresden and, and, in the wild. And for West. the record, too, I'm I uh, behind the scenes. I'm bad at blurbs, so I'll like say something. Oh, that's great. And I'll be like, uh, "So does that sound good to you guys, or would you <laughs> like it be different?" And they're like, "Well, what if we said this?" Like, "Oh, I totally say that." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the worst blurber. Yes, we I'm, had a very similar conversation. <laughs> oh, you and me? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I, I liked it. Does, can you do anything know, with can that? You, can you use any yeah. of that? And you're like, what about this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst blurber. So if you ever want to blurb for me, be like, hey, Larry, would you say this about me? I'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. Maybe that's the best way to get a blurb from Larry Korea. That's fine. <laughs> well, uh, Jim was a, a huge inspiration to me. Monster Hunter was a huge oh, inspiration to me. Uh, Oliver Wyman did a phenomenal oh, job. Yeah, so, the, guy's, the guy's a beast. Um, yeah, I love him. The, I was going to say a little bit, but I was saying is like, it's a lot of this business is timing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always an element of luck, but it's not. And so for you guys out there, you know, who are getting into this and or whether you're trying to get into writing or publishing or whatever it is, luck and timing have a big part to do with it. But compared to work and connections and knowledge, nothing. I mean, so if, like you guys, you had Rhett's business acumen yeah. and, and Man. you know, just you guys have hustled your butt off. Yeah. I mean, you've yeah. worked hard to get to where you're at. And I think it's kind of awesome to see in a, in a kind of a dinosaur industry to see stuff uh, popping. Yeah. And new guys coming along and competing in this sphere. It's awesome. It's, it's really been a fun five years. I mean, it's, there's, there's the stresses that are involved. And, like, you know, we were asked last, maybe two years ago at 20 Books, Craig asked. Craig's one of our authors, Craig Martell. He's done 15 books with us. And he asked us, you know, would you do a talk on um, – starting your own publishing company. And I said, well, can I tell you something? I'm not going to tell anyone how to do what we do or other, we're not creating competition for us, but we we're in a room similar to this and it was, it was packed. And I said, raise your hand if you're an author and the whole one. I said, okay, now leave your hand up if you know how to sell your own books. And maybe 10% of the place still had their hand up. I said, okay, you with your hands up, you can stay. Everyone else needs to go because publishing is not, a new avenue to make money when you couldn't make money on your own. It's not easy. It's really freaking hard. There's a lot of things that we will never ever divulge about what we know about this industry. Um, 
Well, that's hard. That's hard earned trade secrets. And and there's there's folks all the time that want to share their stuff with us, hoping that kind of we're going to share back. And listen, I'm I'm the nicest dude. I try to be the nicest dude you'll ever meet. I'll 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 buy any of you dinner if you need dinner. Like that's not an. But don't ask me to share with you why I'm successful because my kids need to eat. Right. Yeah, and me and Steve come from. Uh, we work together as uh, uh, military defense contractor uh, accountants. <laughs> there's, there's just there's stuff you don't share. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can speak in generalities and stuff, but but it's actually actual trade secrets. Yeah, of course not. And and and, and yeah, so don't give those out. Also, too, it's funny because people are always they're always rooting for you to fail. Ugh. You always have people rooting yep. for you to fail, and they will take anything that happens in your industry. And they'll take it as a sign of, of, of reinforcing their preconceived notions. We about had you. an error. We work with uh, with a, an audiobook company on one of the largest properties that we have, and narrator notes got left in the manuscript. And of course, as the print and ebook publisher, it is not my job to read through the entire book when we're formatting it. I assumed I had what we needed. It got published. Those forums, those groups were ripping us apart over three lines of narrator notes that we fixed within 24 hours. And we're like, we're just sitting back going, how are we? First of all, it's lit RPG, so everything's <laughs> brackets and carrots and parentheses. Yeah, so it's not like a, it's it's like brackets are going to pop out. on a <laughs> screen. We, you click through the book and it just looks like another thing in a crazy person's book that wrote an amazing thing. And you're like, I don't know what any of these brackets are. about 250,000 words yeah, for the man. RPG is 50,000 of that's tables. Yes, <laughs> and, and you know? you've got 15 words that were meant for the narrator yeah, it, that just accidentally got left in. I don't blame the audio publisher. I don't blame the, uh, stuff happens. But the number of people that wanted to say, look at Athon, yeah, this, can't even do this. I'm like, this God. is This is a sign of the failure of the people I don't like. And I yeah. get that all the time, and, and, and everybody gets that. And the thing is, though, if you've paid any attention to the publishing industry, there's constant screw-ups. Oh, yeah. Because there, there's that a... Happen, that happened in the, the Predator anthology that you were in. Oh, yeah. There was... Uh, I think it was... Wasn't on Maybury? Listen, Harry Potter calls him Severus Snap. Oh, no. In the first print of Harry Potter. <laughs> it's Harry Potter! I actually have... I, have, I had uh, an entire print run of paperbacks come out with the wrong uh, name on the spine. They actually had, it was the, um, and so, so it's like the spine is for a different novel of mine was the entire print run. This recently happened in a digital form where uh, a publisher credited a very well-known author on KDP as Chuck Tingle. <laughs> it's just like a month ago. That very well-known author is here and I will not say his name. I texted him. I said, hey, Chuck. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't help that, like, no one knows who Chuck Tingle is. We do. Right? I, I, think, I think our audience all knows you know, who Chuck Tingle is. <laughs> but I found that very funny. Um, and it happens all the time. There's errors in books all the time, especially first prints, right? Like, and especially in a market where we work as fast as we work. Uh, people give us crap about, you know, uh, this this happens a lot. We get quality issue reports, and sometimes our books are suppressed for quality issues, right? And, and, and within that first day, and I think this is what people don't understand, when you have two million page reads day one, and all of those people are reporting the same errors, Amazon goes, this book is a mess. It's like eight errors in a 250,000 word book, but they're getting so many reports about it that Amazon goes, this must be not good quality, fix it or it's suppressed. And the outside market doesn't realize this is minute stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, it's an, an, you yep. know, or the, the, it, and, it's. And when you're talking about that many words, having to release them as quickly as we do, we've got an editor, we've got proofers, people miss things. We're not Brandon Sanderson. We don't have nine rounds of editing on It doesn't matter. Book. He has Brandon, the same problems I agree. as you do. Brandon has like 47 employees. Right. 23. Oh, 23. Oh, see, Steve knows better than you. But he's got, we know how. <clears throat> I mean, he's got an entire thing around him, right? I don't, I, I'm, I'm just me by myself as a writer. I don't have an assistant or anything. And right. people are like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Because I'm writing books. And, and you got, I mean, if you're, if you're a small business publishing house, uh, you have like four employees. Right. 
you know. Well, and they want the book so fast. The readers yeah. want the book so fast, but they yeah, don't you realize. Guys, and what, your turnaround time is quick. A month, a, a month between books on on sci-fi and and most fantasy. Three months with lit RPG. Well, you got like three proofers just for Rick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, Rick has a, a team, you know, that, that work with him. Uh, he I, he probably knows who his editor is better than I do right now because the reality is every series ends up sort of with a different editor. Um, you only have two? Okay. And we got Jeff Haskell here, Jeff and, and Pacey Holden, and these guys are all working tirelessly to put out a lot of science fiction. Yeah. And the hardest part when you're the, when you're the publisher is going to the writer and saying, you have to finish three books before we publish one. Yeah, I mean, we had that conversation. Yep. We had and that conversation. And I feel like an idiot, but I do it too. But but see, but here's the difference, though. Here's the difference, and and maybe this be maybe this is because of the experiences that like Larry and I have had together um, co-writing. Um, we've sold. I mean, Larry and I have sold books next to each other for the better part of a decade now, and so often we see the whole oh, you're starting a new series. I'm just not going to read that right now because it's too, it, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have the patience to yep. wait or yeah. whatever. The, yeah. the whole adoption hump thing, right? And we're both accountants, so we understand how numbers work yep. and math and stuff. And so when you and I had that conversation, my response was, oh, okay, yep. I get it. Yep. Yeah, Understood. I expand on that a little bit because this is something we have talked on the show is that, um, and I don't know how bad it is in sci-fi, but I know in fantasy it's epidemic. Yeah where it's like the, the, the syndrome where the customer is not willing to invest in an epic fantasy series yep. until it's done. Because we've all got burned 100%. by the same couple it's guys. A, it is the same. It's, not, it's not the same reason. It's, um, we, we, so we don't sell to readers. Right. We sell to machines mm -hmm. that sell to readers. When you're looking at things from Larry Correa's perspective, who's been around for 15 years and is ingrained in this industry, it is not the same as talking about a new author. Right. The marketing advice that I hear from people who have been doing this for a long time, I go, none of that is real. Yeah. I've heard so much at this con in the past five years that I go, please, nobody listen to that. Stop. Like what? I can't. I can't do it. Oh. Craig is a great friend of mine. I love him. I love this con. I love the people in this con. And I think that the intention behind the things that are spoken are good. But Rhett and I know without a doubt, it's not real. I'll tell you this, ads are a part of things. The algorithm's all that matters, guys. It's all that matters. I've talked to KDP, it's all that matters. The algorithm, if it doesn't pick up in the next, in the first two weeks your book is launched, stop with this book. It doesn't matter anymore. It's not gonna go anywhere, it's not gonna do anything. We don't live in a world where you release book four and the whole series takes off. That's Jim Butcher and that was because somebody put millions of dollars behind getting his book in front of the right people. The KDP algorithm doesn't allow for that. I could drop $40,000 into a book today, and if it's not in the algorithm, it's never gonna pick up. I just lost $40,000. Uh, you can pay for ads. Um, you, can make, you can spend $30,000 to make $32,000. That's fine, if that's how you wanna do it. We use DSP, we use some of those things for some of these projects. Uh, but it's not to make money, it's to look like it made money because we have to you know, have successful things look, you know, you have to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's for the longevity of the author. We are always, oh, thank you so much. We're always author first. We will we'll do whatever it takes to make sure that our authors have the best success that they can. But with the three books at once, it's because we live in a rapid release society. The algorithm is a three month algorithm. You have a new release algorithm. Those first three months are what matter most for your entire series. So you release book one and when it catches algorithm, you continue dumping money into the ads. You continue doing what you need to do. Book two comes out a month later, book three comes out a month later, and then we go back to the author and we go, hey, you're gonna keep writing this because it's good for you to keep writing this. And if you don't wanna keep writing this, that's fine, but we're telling you that this would be your best bet. Mm -hmm. You're getting 1,200, 1,500, you know, 2,000 pre-orders per book, a guaranteed one to 2,000 pre-orders is better than trying to start over again. Um, and you know, typically speaking, an author gets one big series. It's not always true. But like we look at guys who have had millions and millions of dollars made in a series who are now working with us because they can't sell their shoes. Um, so I know, you know, a lot of what I say sounds negative, but it's like it's 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 attempting to encourage folks that like just because you wrote that book and you 
did I release the superhero series these past couple of months during Amazon Broken World? And superheroes are the hardest thing to sell on the planet. There's nothing harder. Um, they flopped. I've got books with thousands and thousands of ratings and all this, and then I'm sitting on these things that I can't find a way to move them to save my life. And I went, ah, it sucks. I'm going to write the next book. But that's the attitude that we have to have in this industry. If you want to write a book because it's fun, that's cool. But if you want to write a book to make money, there are things that you can do to give yourself the advantage. And some of it is shopping your darlings, like the whole book. But that's why we say let's have three books up front because what we want to do is we want to get those three books out. And if they don't have success, we have a new option, the box set. Mm -hmm. It's a new opportunity to make money to get in it. And it's not actually as cheap, as like cheap and cheaty as it feels like because what we're trying to do is we're trying to re-reach the market with a brand new book one. You're trying to re-spike the algorithm if you didn't spike yes. it the first time. So it's like, it's like a second... It's a second go a few months later to try to get that new, yep. that new fresh start. I mean, have you ever had a book that you know is good and it just didn't do what you wanted it to do? And everyone who reads it loves it, right? We get so many authors that are like, I know this is going to be big because everyone that's read it loves it. And we're like, that has, that's, that's about 8% of why a book sells. Oh, yeah, because we all know people who are terrible who make lots of money yeah. at this. And so, you know, I've got books that like, I just, God, I wish they sold, but they didn't. And there's, you know, there's options. I, I don't know. I could re-release it under a new name and get brand new data and brand new everything and all of that. And that's, that's fine. I happen to be in a position where I could just say, I'm going to write my next stuff, my next book, my next series. And that's now a big, nice poster on my wall. And I love those covers and I love the book. And someday some people might read it. This, this that's actually, I, they just came in and gave us our two minute mm -hmm. warning. Man, that is absolutely fascinating stuff. Because like it's really easy. I say all the time on the show, people people say, "Well, how did you how did you do it? How did you make a career?" Yeah, I've been doing this a long time. So how I did it is relevant. Yeah, the answer is usually I don't know. Like most people who are good sellers really don't know. You can't get good. Like there's folks that just you know, Craig Allenson is a great example. Craig Allenson put out a book with a homemade book cover and no editing. And he just threw it up on Amazon with no plan and no marketing. And his first month, he made $40,000 on Expeditionary Force. Um, he doesn't know why he sells. He's, I, I, like, I, I like Craig. He's a good guy. But he's not the guy to ask, how do you do this? Because for him, it was luck. And then a great book. Right? That, that actually – that we always tell our authors, we're going to do the part of launching you to success. Your book carries you after that. Yeah, because if you, if you have a piece of crap and you get a big release, okay, you sold a lot of that first one. Yep. Now you're done. But because... they're not getting – the word of mouth matters at yeah. that point. That's right. But visibility is, is number one. So the thing that mainly changed is, is the algorithm for your opening. Yes. It's all about the, it used to be about, in the olden times, it was all about that original week sales velocity in bookstores, and would you get on the newspaper bestseller list? Now it's an Amazon bestseller list. Yeah, now it's yeah. the Amazon bestseller list. Now it's the Amazon And everything algorithm. we launch, everything. So we just traded bestseller. giant evil mega corporations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know how to make a bestseller out of anything. But, but whether it sticks there has to do with the, the algorithm and, and the, the reading um, habits of the people reading it, right? And are people initial reading, thousands of readers will tell their they, friends, this yep, is awesome. And are they finishing, right? You might get a crap ton of book reads, uh, page reads, or you might get a crap ton of sales. But like if the people aren't reading it, hey, Amazon knows that. They know, oh, they didn't make it to the 15% mark. It kicks down on the algorithm. All of those things play in together as to whether or not your book is going to continue to be pushed in the Amazon algorithms. So it's all encompassing. You do have to write good books. Of course you have to write good books. But that is actually the easiest part, in my opinion, writing a good book. Yep. All right. Well, that's all the time we have left. Um, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, man. Really, really me. appreciate it. Yeah, we'll get you, you on those. another time okay. to continue this ever, like, evergreen conversation. Yeah. Um, well, by next year, it'll all change anyway. <laughs> for <Yeah>. sure. Yeah. <laughs> by next month. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, thanks so much. Thanks for making time for us, man. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks so much for all the really good, the really good information. Um, so, uh, and to the audience who's here, thank you guys so much for showing up and listening to us talk to each other and not you. We appreciate it. Um, so, anyway, this is the Writer Dojo, and we'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. 
theme song, Word Mercenaries, by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday, wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Then you should definitely buy whatever book is during the commercial break. <laughs>